At 12.30 a.m. on December 20th, 1930, in Chicago's predominantly Jewish Albany Park neighborhood, an explosion and fire took place in a little butcher shop. Beside the butcher shop was a dry goods store owned by Irving and Dora Israelson. The Israelsons lived in a small apartment behind their store with their two sons, Homer, aged five, and Jerome, aged four. The explosion nearly leveled the apartment block and the fires spread from the butcher shop to the Israelsons' apartment. Irving was not at home at the time. Chicago, 1930. The Great Depression had just started and Prohibition was in full swing. Al Capone was at the height of his power. Chicago was a town where nobody could forget how the money was made. It was picked up from floors still slippery with blood. Norman Mailer. Harry Goldvarg owned the butcher shop located at 3655 Kenzie Avenue. He had just opened the shop November 15, 1930, five weeks earlier. My uncle is, the boy's father had gone out to a meeting for the evening and my Aunt Dora stayed home with her two young boys and put them to bed and then it was getting close to midnight so she herself went to bed and was woken up by a fire. Um, the fire was all around her and she started to scream so the neighbors heard her, came over and literally pulled her through the window by her hair. As soon as she got out and realized that the boys were still in the building, she ran back in. As soon as she got to the building, the, fire, the flames were so big that they actually set her on fire and the building collapsed before her, like right in front of her. And uh, the neighbors realized that nobody could save those boys and they just pulled my aunt out and put the flames out. Firefighters arrived quickly, but the building was heavily damaged and engulfed in flames. Homer and Jerome were both crushed and burnt to death. The first police officer on the scene was Captain Joseph Goldberg. Captain Goldberg had already made a name for himself, being the youngest and first Jewish officer to make captain in Chicago. It was a dangerous time to be a cop in the city, but Captain Goldberg was tough. Sometimes he got his name in the newspapers for committing or suspicion of illicit acts. Several months before the fire, he was suspended for beating his former police commander. I've heard this story mostly from my father-in-law about the Chicago fire. And uh, one of the most interesting characters is Captain Joseph Goldberg, who was the first police officer on the scene, who was fairly famous, a, a, you know, a Jewish police officer out from Albany Park. And he arrived and quickly assessed the situation and realized that this was arson. To test his theory, what he did was he got on a local call box. He got the butcher who owned the butcher shop, Harry Goldvarg, got his phone number, and Captain Goldberg phoned him and just said two words, job's done, and hung up the phone. Then he waited, and 20 minutes later, the butcher, Harry Goldvarg, showed up, and the police captain, Goldberg, said, what are you doing here? And he said, uh, oh, I heard there was a fire. And he goes, yeah, how'd you hear that? He said, uh, I don't know. He goes, I'll tell you how. I phoned you, and all I said was, job's done, and here you are. Then he. Then Goldberg, the captain, took the butcher into the alley and, you know, coerced a confession out of him. The butcher, Harry Goldvarg, was taken into custody that morning and provided detailed testimony of the arson plot. He then named his accomplices, Jack Rosso, Jacob Tattleman, and Martin Borad. At this time, police were also searching for a fifth man whose identity they would not reveal. Harry Goldvark had been approached by this unnamed person in his butcher shop who sold him $600 worth of fixtures for $200 that Goldvark then insured for $3,800. 
According to court documents, Rosso and Tattleman, in presence of Goldvard, spread large quantities of paper over the shop and poured five gallons of gasoline over top. Goldvard left the butcher shop about 5.30 p.m. About 12.30 a.m. that same night, Borad drove Rosso and Tattleman to the vicinity of the butcher shop. Tattleman went in with a key that Goldvarg had provided earlier, setting the shop on fire and running quickly away. A large explosion and fire occurred. The news coverage of the fire was widespread. This was likely due to the grisly nature of the tragedy and the fact that criminal elements were involved. In the early days of the police investigation, it was clear that the perpetrators didn't have much remorse about the death of Homer and Jerome. In fact, Harry Goldvarg was more concerned with still collecting the insurance money. Several newspapers at the time reported that the butcher asked, can I still collect the insurance? I need the money to hire an attorney and to pay the men who set the fire. Early in their investigation, neither Captain Goldberg or District Fire Attorney Scott Hogan would divulge the name of the fifth suspect. But three days later, it was revealed to be Louis Footlick, a well-known and wealthy Chicago businessman. Footlick was charged with murder, but his case was tried in a separate court. The next day, news broke about a sixth man also being sought in connection with the fire. This was Jaime, the slob, Lieberman, reputed West Side mob boss. When questioned, Captain Goldberg insisted that Lieberman was not connected. The trials of the main four suspects took place in April and May of 1931. Jack Rosso pled guilty to two counts of murder and turn state's evidence for the prosecution. Jacob Tattleman and Harry Goldvarg pled not guilty on the grounds that their crime was manslaughter and not first degree murder since they believed there was no malice aforethought. Manslaughter carried a sentence of one to 14 years. For first degree murder, they faced the electric chair. Prosecutor Daniel Covelli wanted the death penalty for all those charged. The father of the boys asked the court to put aside the death penalty. He didn't support capital punishment and was quoted saying he wanted the men who murdered his children to think about Homer and Jerome for the rest of their lives. The judge was Joseph Sabbath, who went on to become the most famous divorce court judge in US history presiding over more than 55,000 cases. Evidence came out both before and during the trial that this arson was the work of a firebug ring. Tattleman and Rosso were implicated in several additional fires, including three restaurants where Tattleman collected insurance monies. Judge Sabbath sentenced Harry Goldvard to 40 years, Jacob Tattleman to 40 years, and Jack Rosso to 30 years due to his cooperation. Martin Borad's charges were dropped when the other defendants stated he had no knowledge of the plot. Jaime, the slob Lieberman, was never charged in this case, and Louis Footlick, the alleged mastermind of the arson ring, was Noel Prost, with all charges dropped due to lack of evidence. Because of his connections and influence, it appears for this case, he was untouchable. Despite all press reports, Dora Israelson survived her injuries, but always covered herself completely due to the burn scars. Harry Goldvarg was sent to the notorious Joliet prison, where he was killed four years later. He was actually murdered. He was stabbed. And it's not written down anywhere, but you know, somebody told us on the phone that he was likely stabbed because he was a child killer and uh, they weren't tolerated in Joliet prison. Captain Joseph Goldberg went on to investigate many famous cases, including the internationally reported Suzanne Deegan story, 
the brutal rape, mutilation, and murder of a nine-year-old girl. He was also investigated three times for corruption, twice by the grand jury and once by the U.S. Senate with no resulting prosecution. In 1933, the Chicago Tribune wrote, reputedly wealthy and possessed of political influence, Captain Goldberg is regarded as something of a czar in Albany Park. Firebug Jacob Tattleman sought parole in May of 1948, having served 17 years of his 40-year sentence. He received parole three years later in 1951. He was 62 years old. Rosso also got out of prison in the 1950s. Irving and Dora stayed married but didn't have any more children. They never stopped talking about their children. And my earliest memories of my aunt um, were her talking about both boys. She always called Jerome Jerry and she would tell stories as if they'd happened just yesterday, as if the boys were still alive because in her mind and her children were, were still these young little boys. Um, never had a chance to grow up, so for her, they were always four and five. Homer and Jerome Israelson are buried in Chicago's Waldheim Cemetery. Our immortality comes through our children, through our roots and branches. A dead child destroys entire family trees, forests, all of them gone. Amy Harmon. <laughs>